Louisiana, a state rich in its environment, but poor, desperately poor, almost to the point of being bankrupt when it comes to protecting it. This may not be God's paradise, as the Bible talks about, but it is a sportsman's paradise, as the motto on the state license plate proudly proclaims. In many ways, Louisiana, with its cypress-studded swamps and majestic live oaks adorned with wisps of Spanish moss, is a world unto itself, a sort of ecological microcosm. Surely, as one environmentalist mused, when Noah built his ark, he must have somehow lost his way and mistakenly drifted down the Mississippi River, finally shipwrecking in the lush emerald green marshes of South Louisiana. No other state in the country, none, not a single one, has such a diverse ecology and such an abundance of wildlife and plant life. Louisiana ranks number one in the landings of fish and shellfish, number one in fur production, and it provides winter grounds for 80% of the waterfowl in the Mississippi Flyway, not to mention untold hours of recreational fishing and hunting. Famed naturalist poet Henry David Thoreau might well have been thinking about Louisiana when he wrote, O nature, I do not aspire to be the highest in thy choir, to be a meteor in thy sky or comet that may range on high only a zephyr that may blow among the reeds by the river low. Give me thy most privy place where to run my airy race. As an environment, it's, uh, it's some of the best in the world. Uh, God may have had several Edens in mind, but uh, uh, for a coastal, marsh, swamp, dreamy dreams, productive kind of, just go out and pick it up. It's out there. Fish it, catch it, enjoy it. This is top of the heap. In terms of the way people treat it, it's, it's got to be one of the worst places of the world, this side of, well, you name it. Uh, throw it out the window, throw it in the water, leave it rotting on the land, sink it, deep well inject it. Uh, if this state wanted to destroy itself as a state objective, it probably couldn't be doing it much better than it's doing now as an environmental program. Trouble in Paradise is a special 90-minute documentary report brought to you exclusively by Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Now, LPB News Director Ken Johnson. Good evening. Perhaps no other issue of our time has aroused the passions of a great many people in Louisiana more than the issue of the environment. How do we protect it? How do we preserve it for our children and their children? History has taught us that Louisiana's legacy is one of neglect. Today we are in danger of poisoning our water, our air, and our land. Just look around. We are surrounded by thousands of abandoned and active hazardous waste sites, oil field waste pits, and injection wells. Now, to head off what some feel could become an environmental Armageddon, the state legislature in recent years enacted some of the toughest pollution laws in the country. But by and large, our environmental rules and regulations pack no punch because there's no money to enforce them. Polluters know it, and as a result, they may be literally getting away with murder. The evidence can be found just about anywhere in Louisiana. Take this desolate farm field in southwest Louisiana. Now, acting on a tip, we went there and followed tire tracks from an 18-wheeler up to the edge of a small bayou. The water itself was covered by a thick, obnoxious-smelling chemical slick. Tests showed the water was contaminated by heavy metals, the kind that can cause cancer. Another example. This is a photograph of Marla Bayou near Kaplan, as you would see it looking upstream. Nothing appears out of the ordinary. But this is Marla Bayou just a few miles downstream. Notice the chemical film on the water. But just as importantly, notice the difference along the shoreline. Much of the vegetation here is dead. People who live nearby claim Marla Bayou is a favorite spot of so-called midnight dumpers. I would like to tell you that we're not going to have any illegal dumping. And certainly the laws are designed that way. But I think we're always going to have to deal with some abuses of the law and some violation of the law. I think the ultimate result, dealing with the scarce economic resources that we have, is that every citizen is going to have to have a watchful eye for these kinds of things that are occurring. And when they are occurring, use the parts of the law that allows them to be a complainant, that allows them to be an enforcer of the environmental laws, to develop educational programs as to what their rights are in making such a complaint. 
Most citizens don't know that they can incur no liability by virtue of reporting a dumper or an illegal dumper to the department. Because of the state's strict new environmental laws, which in some cases call for civil penalties of up to $100,000 for each incident and criminal penalties of up to 10 years in prison, officials at the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality believe the problem of midnight dumpers for the most part has been eradicated. But critics argue just the opposite is true. Because there are so many regulations governing the disposal of hazardous wastes, they say more and more small truckers are trying to dodge added expenses and bureaucratic red tape by illegally dumping. I don't have much confidence in these regulatory methods they have today. I know that. But what worries me the most, Ken, is that I see those trucks, I'd say 90% of the time they're traveling around here at night. Now, you think about it, why should these trucks carry these materials at night. And I, I wish I could, you could be around here, see those trucks going around in the country on the back roads at night. In Vermilion Parish, where there has been an ongoing war over environmental issues for the past five years, this is an all too familiar sight. Late at night, a truck pulls up to an abandoned disposal pit and dumps its load. What's a little more hazardous waste to an area already polluted? People who once looked the other way when it was a friend or a neighbor doing the dumping are now outraged. By the hundreds, they have band together to form the Vermilion Association to protect the environment. The group is called Vape, and they're on the lookout for dirty dumpers. Louisiana's in the catch-up mode. Uh, it's learning what the northern tier of states learned a long time ago, that uh, to the extent you, uh, uh, you mess up your own bed, then it gets hard to sleep in it at night. State police and various parish sheriff's departments have been alerted to the problem, but there just aren't enough men or money to go around when it comes to enforcing environmental laws. There is no question that we have midnight dumpers, we have daytime dumpers. I myself followed behind a huge truck that had the title Hazardous Waste Disposal Company, and I don't remember the name and couldn't see it from the distance. And there, at the back of that hazardous waste truck, the valve was open as it went down I-10 from New Orleans East to, to Baton Rouge. I couldn't catch up to get the license number because we were jammed in traffic. That's going on. There are midnight dumpers that are dumping in the ditches. There are midnight dumpers that are dumping in the Mississippi River. To stop this is going to take a major effort by all law enforcement agencies because midnight dumping is a crime. Sometimes even when you get a license plate number, it doesn't do any good. Recently, a Lafayette man took these photographs after he noticed something unusual going on at a truck stop near New Iberia. An 18-wheeler, the kind used to carry toxic materials, a vacuum truck, was backed up to a drainage ditch, and the driver was hosing out the tank. Suspicious. There was an individual on top, top of the uh, vacuum truck which was washing it out with a hose uh, the back of the truck was open and it was draining onto the ground and flowing into the uh, drainage ditch. Why were you suspicious by all of this? Well, these, these folks haul uh, oil field waste and uh, I know this is not an accepted procedure. And it aroused your suspicions? Oh yes, it, it, it always arouses my suspicion when I see one of these trucks with the back end open like this. It, it's a natural reaction around here. Still not convinced? Well, again, acting on a tip, we went to a closed landfill northeast of Intracoastal City. The site was littered with rusting barrels. Covering the ground was a black, gooey material. Some of it turned out to be nothing more than old roofing material, but mixed in with it was oil field waste, laced with heavy metals. Again, the kind of heavy metals that are suspected to be carcinogenic. Yet surprisingly, this is not on the Department of Environmental Quality's list of abandoned hazardous waste sites. Parish records show that Larry Landry, president of Home Industry Disposal Company, better known as Hidco, ran the landfill before it closed. Landry talked with LPB at his home in Abbeville, but refused to be interviewed on camera. He admitted that he once operated the landfill, but he said he had no idea who put the barrels there. Over the years, Landry has had a running feud with environmentalists in Vermilion Parish. In recent months, he has been turned down not once, not twice, but three times for permits to build a solid waste treatment facility. On each occasion, he ran into stiff opposition from people in Vermilion Parish, people who have stopped 
looking the other way. As for the tests done by various engineers who say they have investigated this site, well, Love Canal was also the subject of intense study by scientists of all kinds. But this did not avert a tragedy. Thank you. Environmentalists contend that it's not just small truckers and landfill operators that are polluting Louisiana. They also point the finger at big business. This is Bayou Trepanye, located in St. Charles Parish. It is a deceptively serene spot with its cypress trees, Tupelo gum, red maple, and live oaks. Serene and beautiful enough to be part of the state's protected natural and scenic river system. Bayou Trepanye is approximately 30 to 50 feet wide and four miles in length. Its headwaters are nestled along the Shell Oil Company's Norco refinery. The Sierra Club has long contended that Shell is polluting the bayou with toxic chemicals. Willie Fontenot, an environmental specialist with the state attorney general's office, agrees. Now, this is a natural and scenic river. It's a protected stream. It should have the highest quality water of any stream in Louisiana or type of stream. And it has the highest levels of chromium and other heavy metals that have been found in any waterway in Louisiana. And in fact, higher than any uh, toxic waste site that I'm aware of in terms of heavy metals such as chromium. Now according to the Department of Environmental Quality, Shell has a permit to legally discharge 168 tons of ammonia nitrogen into the bayou a year. But again, environmentalists believe Shell has been guilty of exceeding its permit levels time and time again. Worst yet, the Sierra Club has also accused Shell of discharging dangerous chemicals into the swamp, chemicals such as arsenic, mercury, lead, zinc, and chromium. The type of materials that have been detected uh, are known or suspected human carcinogens, mutagens, and the type of toxic uh, material that is most definitely harmful to human health and the environment. What do you mean by mutagens? Uh, mutagen is a term where uh, an, a, if a human being consumed uh, a, a mutagenic type of material, it can affect their offspring. The offspring would be born with deformities and so forth. Because of these serious charges, Louisiana Public Broadcasting contracted an independent testing firm, the Super Company of New Iberia, to test the sludges on the bottom of Bayou Trepanye. The samples were taken on a weekend during a heavy rainstorm. Environmentalists have long suspected that major industries along the Mississippi River routinely increase their discharge of affluents during weekends and nights and during inclement weather because the state is less likely to conduct surprise water quality checks. Suber Company took a sample of the sludge on the bottom of the bayou about a half a mile from the shell plant. The water depth was three and a half feet, but the sludge depth was in excess of six feet. The sample was then taken to Subra Company's headquarters in New Iberia, where Wilma Subra, president of the company, conducted a quantitative and qualitative test for heavy metals. Using a sophisticated atomic absorption instrument considered extremely reliable by researchers and scientists, it took Subra several days to test the material and then analyze the data. She then prepared a detailed report for Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Four significant heavy metals were detected. The chromium level in Bayou Trepanier was 370 parts per million, lead 550 parts per million, mercury better than three-tenths of a part per million, and zinc 205 parts per million. In her opinion, Subra said the levels were extremely elevated and dangerous in the sense that the metals could wind up in the food chain. Based on the findings of this test and a similar one conducted by the Sierra Club, Louisiana Public Broadcasting has learned that the state attorney general's office plans to file what could become a landmark environmental lawsuit against Shell Oil Company, the state's second largest refiner. That bayou is, one of the, is listed in our state law as a scenic bayou. Well, it may be scenic on the surface with the surrounding uh, cypress trees and foliage, but uh, beneath those waters, there is pollution, there is toxic waste, and we are sure that it's come from shell. Those waters will not support fish. There are no fish in the bayou. They will not support the animal life that use the water as drinking water. We know that things uh, such as chrome and so forth are, or at least have been present in our discharges. The concentrations of those 
chemicals are at concentrations within the state limits. Do you ever, as a matter of practice, test the sludges on the bottom of the bayou? No, we do not. Why? We have not felt it necessary. On the case of shale oil, we feel that if the Attorney General goes forward with a suit to f sort of follow up on the one that we've already had, that this will send a major signal to industries up and down the river that the state of Louisiana is no, gonna, no longer going to be lax in their enforcement of environmental regulations. If there is sludge there, it's uh, probable that it came from this source. Uh, we are the headwaters of that stream. This is a 70-year-old facility, and I think we're all aware that standards of operation today are different than what they were 70 years ago. Because of those changing practices, Shell contends it is not polluting Bayou Trepanier today. And as evidence, the company provided these photographs to dispute allegations by the Attorney General that the Bayou is dead. I make trips down Bayou Trepanier all the time. Not only is my job with Shell, but uh, I fish and hunt in that area back there. And the facts that I know don't support the, fact, the, the allegation that it's a dead area. There's plenty of bird life. There's plenty of fish life. You see alligators. You see nutria. They're still hunted back there by the, uh, by the trappers. And just, just a, a casual observation without doing any detailed studies on the bayou will tell you or show you that there's plenty of life back there. Under both state and federal law, if Shell is found to be responsible for polluting Bayou Trepanier, the company could be forced to restore it to a pristine condition. It would be an expensive job. Yet from all indications, neither Shell nor the state of Louisiana would be eligible to receive any money from the federal Superfund program toward the cleanup. But then again, it wouldn't matter right now, since there is very little money left in the Superfund at all. For that matter, the program itself, considered a cornerstone of environmental policy in this country, is in danger of dying. For environmentalists, it was a long, difficult struggle. First, they had to pinpoint sources of toxic contamination, such as abandoned hazardous waste dumps, injection wells, and oil field waste pits. Then they had to link that contamination to health problems. Finally, they had to link those health problems to industry. It took years and years, but the pattern became unmistakable, irrefutable. Finally, in 1980, the federal government decided it was time to get tough on polluters. Congress adopted a powerful law known as Superfund. It was hailed as the heart and soul of the environmental movement. But today, Superfund is barely alive. Most of its $1.6 billion appropriation has been bled dry by studies, litigation, and administrative costs. Only a handful of the 700 dangerous hazardous waste sites on the Environmental Protection Agency's so-called priority list have been cleaned up. In Louisiana, the word Superfund is a misnomer of sorts. There's not much super about it, really. Louisiana industries contribute nearly a quarter of the entire national Superfund tax, yet the state gets back only a fraction of it. We have about 36% of the hazardous waste uh, locations in this country. We've got three of the four major hazardous waste sites in the whole United States in this state. We receive more hazardous waste than any state in the United States. And we think it's unfair that we're getting back only 1% under those circumstances. Here's how the EPA's report card looks in Louisiana. Of the six sites on the Superfund national priority list, only one, Old Anger and Ascension Parish, has been partially cleaned up so far. The rest, well, for the most part, they're in as bad a shape as they were when they were first discovered. Take Bayou Bonfica in Slidell. Now, technically, it is in the feasibility stage. Practically speaking, that means nothing has been done to clean it up. Then there's Bayou Sorrel in Iberville Parish, where a young man died from poisonous fumes. It's nearing the end of the feasibility stage. Again, that translates into nothing done. And then there's Cleve Reber near Sorrento. It's in the site investigation stage. That too means little if anything has been done to clean it up yet. That's not a good report card for our state already at the bottom of the heap. William DeVille is head of the Department of Environmental Quality's Abandoned Hazardous Waste Section. 
Uh, my best personal guess is that uh, we may have another decade or so uh, before the worst, worst cases get pretty much out of control. All totaled, Louisiana has more than 340 abandoned hazardous waste sites, and those are just the ones state officials know of. Conceivably, there could be hundreds more. Yet only one out of all of these, Petro Processors, is nearing any kind of conclusion. It was the discovery of this environmental disaster north of Baton Rouge that shocked many people in Louisiana into awareness that a hazardous waste problem existed, in fact, in reality, and not just in the minds of those babbling wild-eyed environmental types. Petro Processors was a montage of chemical waste disposal pits, an ugly site disfigured by more than 15 years of unregulated dumping. Finally, it was shut down by the state in 1980. Following four years of litigation, a consortium of companies were ordered in a court consent decree to clean up the site at a cost of more than $50 million. The plan includes off-site encapsulation of the wastes and a 30-year groundwater monitoring program. Chalk one up for Mother Nature. Well, we haven't made nearly as much progress in cleaning up the old sites as we have in taking care of the waste that's generated today. And that's because it just takes so much money to do it. Uh, nobody, I think, really realized how much effort and time has to go into cleaning up one of these old sites or else I don't think they would have ever even thought of putting the waste there. Uh, before you can even turn over one shovel full of waste to remove it, you've got to drill wells, you've got to put in monitoring, you've got to do complete site surveys and make sure that you know where all the waste is. Since you're dealing with an unknown, you've got to be very careful. So it takes a long process to go in and, and evaluate everything, remove the waste, do the groundwater uh, monitoring, all of these things take just a great deal of, of expense and effort. And the state simply hasn't put the resources into that program that it should have. For that matter, neither has the federal government. Realizing this, and realizing there was a serious problem and no money to tackle it, the state legislature in 1983 approved a tax on hazardous waste disposed at legitimate licensed facilities. The tax, based on every dry ton of waste disposed, amounts to about four and a half million dollars a year. Yet, ironically, none of the money goes towards cleaning up abandoned hazardous waste sites. For that matter, no one even seems to know where the money goes. The state tax is it's invoiced by DEQ. It's supposed to be collected by the Department of Revenue. Uh, and then it goes into the general fund rather than back to DEQ for, for cleanups. Nobody knows if the money is being collected. There, we haven't had, a, had anybody able to document where it's going, where it's coming from. And it's just uh, the money, if it, the tax is there, the tax needs to be collected and needs to be put toward cleanup of sites and not, not put away and, and who knows where. The Department of Environmental Quality certainly could use the money. Right now, its abandoned hazardous waste section is made up of only nine people, including investigators. It receives no money, not a single penny, from the state's multi-billion dollar general fund. All DEQ has to operate on is fines and penalties paid from polluters. That money is supposed to go into a state hazardous waste site cleanup fund. But at last check, nearly $3 million in fines was outstanding. DEQ needs the money in a bad way. The main shortcoming is the state of Louisiana has never put any money into discovering new sites. They, they wait until somebody drops something on their desk or tells them, calls them up. They don't have any people out looking for sites. They don't have any money for test of possible sites. And they just are, you know, sort of, if it doesn't come to them, they don't know it's there. And it's just completely, uh, in, all, in most other states in the country, they have active programs to identify where sites might be, what the problems are, and then have a program of ranking, which, which sites should be cleaned up first. We have nothing like that in operation here in the state. This is Bayou Bonfica. Once it was one of the most picturesque spots in St. Tammany Parish, with its towering 250-year-old oak trees and crystal clear spring-fed water. But not anymore. Today, you won't find Bayou Bonfica in any travel brochures. Its unmatched scenery and serenity have been polluted and poisoned. Land raped by man and left for dead as an abandoned hazardous waste site. Bayou Bonfica is located in the heart of growing Slidell, just a few blocks from City Hall, two public schools, and hundreds of worried people. I imagine what's going to happen if the Superfund doesn't come through is it's going to sit there. Certainly we can't afford to clean it up, though we would very much like to. 
Uh, I doubt the state of Louisiana can. I think either the federal government's going to clean it up or it's going to sit there in a polluted state forever. The state right now has less than a million dollars to address all 300 sites in the state, so we'd be pretty hard-pressed to come up with the funds to do the cleanup work. Because of its location to populated areas, this old creosote plant ranks high on the EPA's Superfund hit list. The federal government has spent more than $600,000 on site preparation, conducting tests and holding public hearings. 600000 bucks, and yet today not one barrel, for that matter not even one bucket of the toxic foul-smelling creosote sludge has been removed. And it gets worse. Because of a bitter fight in Washington between congressmen representing environmentalists and those purportedly representing the chemical industry, all work on the site has been stopped. And now there's a possibility that all funding could be cut off, not just in Slidell, but in cities and towns all across Louisiana and across the country, where people live in fear of the suspected killer that lurks next door. Since I was a city councilman back in 1978, I've been hearing about the pollution, and people tell us it's extremely polluted to the extent that uh, some private industry who's considered that land uh, really can't use it. Uh, we considered it one time as a potential site for a city park. We ended up rejecting it precisely because of the pollution. It's, it's bad. As I've told you, I was recently a attending a, a meeting of the National Environmental Council on which I s serve, at which Lee Thomas, the administrator of the fund, said that Congress is in a major debate over the source of the funds whether it should come from just the chemical companies or whether it should also come as an excise tax on all users or, or if not an excise as an add-on value tax against all those who were in the chain of field that use chemicals and other proposals. And because they're deadlocked over how the funds shall be raised, the bill is in jeopardy. And we were told that if something doesn't happen in a very short time, and that's in weeks or months, he is to, going to begin to phase out the Superfund program altogether. The problem is that EPA Superfund taxing authority expired on September 30th, leaving the agency limping along, conserving money to pay its staff and doing only emergency life-threatening cleanups. Last year, the Senate and House differed on how much money should be in the Superfund. But the real heart of the debate was a bitter struggle over how much authority to give EPA. Environmentalists want strict congressionally mandated schedules for EPA action, uniform cleanup standards, and new rights enabling people who claim injuries from hazardous waste exposure to sue the responsible parties in court. Louisiana Congressman Billy Tozan, one of the key architects of the House version of the Superfund bill, argued that such an approach would only lead to more money being spent on lawsuits and less money on the actual cleanup of sites. Congressman Tozan has played a key role in promoting what we consider to be a very weak and, and ineffective piece of legislation. And unfortunately, the practical effect of what he's proposing uh, will be in the long run uh, an increase in the risk to public health and, and an increase in the financial exposure of the states and the local communities that are affected and ultimately the victims of, uh, of these toxic waste sites. Uh, let's just uh, poppycock. The truth is we started a super fun effort in Louisiana long before the federal government did. It was my committee, the Committee of Natural Resources in Louisiana, that built the first super fun uh, law for, the, for this state before the federal government ever acted. What, what these folks, I'm afraid, won't face is the fact that the last five years of national Superfund policy have been a failure. Uh, they concocted the program on the federal level, and it just hadn't worked. Well, certainly the positions he's taking uh, uh, help the dumpers far more than they help the victims. There's no question about that. Uh, we spent five years, $1.6 billion, and addressed six sites out of thousands around the country. And Louisiana's gotten $10 million back from a $300 million investment. Uh, we've simply failed in our task of addressing hazardous waste pollution in Louisiana and in the nation. And we need a better fund, a better system that works. Let me give you a typical example of where we are. Uh, the, the EPA recently announced a settlement in Ohio of a suit they had against Kim Dine trying to clean up one site, a $19 million settlement. In that $19 million, $7 million has been allocated for attorney's fees at EPA. And when you put the company's attorney's fees on top of that, more money will have been spent in court 
and will be spent on the ground cleaning up the waste site. Well, there's no question that uh, Superfund has been a real gold mine for lawyers. Uh, there's been just an enormous amount of litigation generated, a uh, tremendous amount of time that's gone into negotiations, and very little money and time that's gone into actual cleanup work. Something's got to be done to turn that around so that the money that's collected from industry is used to remove the waste and secure it from the environment instead of to have meetings and discussions and talking about what we're going to do. Ironically, that's the same thing people were saying years ago before the Superfund was even born. The need for such a national law was an outgrowth of the Love Canal disaster. Located in upstate New York, Love Canal had been used as a chemical waste disposal site by Hooker Chemical and Plastics Corporation from the 1920s to the early 1950s. Hooker later sold the land to the Niagara Falls School Board, which later filled it in and built a school. A neighborhood grew up around it. But years later, the chemicals underground rotted through their steel containers and seeped into the soil and water. Gradually, families in the neighborhood began experiencing an abnormally large number of physical problems. Four mentally retarded children were born to families on the same block. Pregnant women miscarried at a rate far above normal. Several children in the area were born with serious birth defects. In August 1978, the hazards were found to be so serious that President Carter declared Love Canal a national emergency area. All I want, all I want, I don't want to be relocated. All I want is my 28.5 and give it to me tonight and I'll go down that road and I'll never look back at the Love Canal again. Because of the contamination, 239 families qualified for permanent relocation. 236 of them left. The homes were boarded up or destroyed, and the school was closed. The whole neighborhood, it turned out, had been built on a chemical waste dump. Today, in many small towns across South Louisiana, there is a fear that the same thing could happen here, in your town, in my town. Well, I was born in a small town. This is Kaplan, Louisiana, population 5,143. It's a quiet little town, not much different than a Mission, Kansas, or a Rockland, Maine, or any one of thousands of other quiet little towns around the country where Friday night high school football games and Sunday afternoon church outings are the big news of the week. No, not much out of the ordinary ever takes place in Kaplan, at least not until recently. Inexplicably, during a 10-month period, Three members of the same family all died, and many people in this predominantly Catholic town are worried, some of them downright frightened by the thought that the mysterious killer could still be on the loose. The prime suspect, an abandoned hazardous waste pit, which may have contaminated the family's well. My father had cancer of the pancreas, and I figured there was something wrong uh, somewhere. That's when I had my, my well water tested, you know, my drinking water. And we found the same chemicals that were in those oil fuel pits back there were in my uh, drinking water. And those chemicals do cause cancer. The, ch the chemicals that are in there, you know, chromium and barium do cause leukemia and cancer. Today, there are few reminders of the tragic chain of events. The pit has been filled in, and now Jerome Vincent farms the land, which he claims poisoned his water and then took the lives of three loved ones. His wife, Geraldine, was the first to die, a victim of leukemia. Soon afterward, his father, William, died of cancer. And then a son, Michael, dropped dead unexpectedly. Doctors suspect a heart attack. As for Jerome Vincent, he's convinced the killer lurked underground, contaminating his well and then slowly murdering his family one by one with every glass of water, with every cup of coffee they drank. Well, I, I think people should... Uh which I think they're getting more aware of the problem, but I think we should wake up and uh, for our, our kids and their, ki their children, you know, uh, wake up and, and try to clean up the environment. The death of three family members in less than a year was not only hard on Jerome Vincent, but it was also tough on his mother, Mabel. She says it was like living through a nightmare. With the, the death of three in the family in, in less than a year, it was. 
How about you? Are you bitter? Do you believe it had anything to do with the hazardous waste site? Well, I think it did have, but I'm not bitter about it. I mean, I just think that it did. It, that's what that's what happened to his water. Uh, every time they took a test of it, it was bad. They claimed that it was it was bad, and they told him not to drink it. But that was after his wife had died. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that was after. And after his son had died. Yeah. So far, there is no proof, only suspicions and fears, that the Vincent family's contaminated water supply contributed to all three deaths. But there is proof, irrefutable proof, that the water was bad. How did it happen? How did it go unnoticed? Well, for as long as anyone in these parts can remember, farmers and landowners have been leasing their property to oil companies for exploration and development. In the Vincent case, Superior Oil had drilled a 21,000-foot deep well plugged it and then moved on. Left behind was an oily pit such as this one used to dispose of salt water and the chemical byproducts of drilling. The pit was also filled with broken and rusting chemical drums. Jerome Vincent became concerned. Finally, after one family member died and then another, he had his water tested. The findings? Chromium, barium, lead, zinc, and phenol. Some levels exceeding the limits allowed in drinking water by the Environmental Protection Agency tests of the superior oil waste pit turned up the same chemicals. A spokesman for Mobile Oil, which has acquired Superior, would not comment on the findings because of a pending $1 million suit filed by the Vincent family. But people who live nearby, they're talking and they're scared. My concern is that we have a high level of cancer in the state and in Vermillion Parish, and also we have a high a large number of disposal wells and uh, hazardous waste sites in our state. Are you convinced at this point, in your own mind, that the two are intertwined? I'm convinced there's some correlation. The degree of the correlation, I don't know, but I would think it's highly correlated between uh, the cancer rate and the disposal of waste in our, in our state. The oil and gas industry not only brought money and jobs to Vermilion Parish, but a wealth of problems as well. At last count, there were some 3,500 disposal wells and waste pits scattered across the countryside. By contrast, there are only twice as many privately owned drinking wells, many of them relatively shallow, and many of them, according to studies, laced with chemicals used in drilling mud and found in waste pits. For people in Vermilion Parish, it was like having a skeleton in the closet. People were afraid to talk about it. Too much money, too many jobs were at stake. But that was before Gay Hanks of Kaplan took up the crusade. She watched her little daughter die of leukemia. When she began to ask why, so did others. Well, you know, Gay, it's like a dark secret. And no one wants to discuss it. You know, no one, nobody really wanted it to come out. But I think it's a good thing that it is. But it's time. Yeah, but now that it affects more and more people, that more and more families are being touched by this terrible tragedy, people are now willing to say, I will help you. What can I do to help? That's true. They want to become involved now. Gay Hanks says doctors at St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, where her six-year-old daughter Angela was treated before her death, were the first to make her think about the connection between chemicals and cancer. There were many people that were going up to St. Jude's the same time as us, many people from the area, you know, relative to the number of people treated there. And uh, the doctor casually mentioned to me one day that he thought he was treating a lot of children from South Louisiana and wondered what it was that was making us all have to take our children up there. And it was a while after she died before I begin to think of, well, what is the link? Why do we have so many children in South Louisiana at St. Jude's? And uh, I began to be interested in the environment. And also, people at that time were just being uh, inundated with these facilities that were being built. And uh, at the onset, if they would ask the, the owner of the land, what, well, what are you doing? What are you what are you digging there? He'd say, well, I'm digging a crawfish pond or I'm digging a fish pond. And two or three weeks later, big trucks would start dumping there. Ken, my gut feeling is that uh, there's, there's a lot, a lot more cancer today than there was then. I can drive down the highway going south of town here, 
and I'll guarantee you within five, well, within six miles, seven miles, I can show you the homes of widows who are living there, their husband died of cancer, uh, leukemia, lung cancer, what have you. I mean, it's, it's right, right there. May, like I say, maybe years ago, of course, we have more people now, but I'm not treating more people today than I was 35 years ago in my practice. I'm not seeing more people, really. You're just seeing more cancer patients? Yes, a lot more. For years, Gay Hanks was a lone voice in the woods. When she cried out, critics claimed she cried wolf. Where's the proof they wanted to know? Well, the first evidence was discovered here at the old Gulf Coast Premix Services site near Abbeville. State investigators called it an environmental nightmare. At one time, the company ran three disposal sites, all of them now closed, but state records show that carcinogenic waste is still leaching into the groundwater and running off into Vermilion River. Now there is new, even more startling evidence. According to a federal EPA internal memorandum, recent tests of land near the waste site have turned up significant heavy metal contamination, arsenic, barium, chromium, iron, lead, mercury, sodium, and zinc. Worst of all, the report concluded, the contamination is spreading. Based on what they've found and what they've reported so far, uh, I would be seriously concerned if anyone were using uh, particularly uh, uh, shallow uh, groundwater for drinking water purposes. Uh, I would be seriously concerned if I lived in the vicinity and the, the water from that facility, the overflow from that facility were, were flowing through my neighborhood or uh, through, through the pastures that I used or through farmlands. Uh, and I would want to see some, uh, some analytical uh, work done on, the, on the, both the, the surface water in the area and on, uh, on, on soils. Another major problem at Gulf Coast is overflow from heavy rains. Now DEQ officials are looking at ways of preventing the spread of contaminants from the site while a long-term solution is being found. Drinking water in the area is supplied by private wells and there is concern that these wells could be contaminated from these pits. Bottom sediments at Gulf Coast showed contaminant levels as high as 45,400 parts per million. An adjacent pit on the DL Mud property showed contaminant levels up to 17,480 parts per million. Both pits on occasion overflow into a ditch that runs through a pasture where cattle graze. Also at one time a guard service worked at the site and reported turning away a number of unauthorized trucks that attempted to dump there. But when we visited the site, there were no guards present. Louisiana Public Broadcasting has learned that the Department of Environmental Quality is studying a plan to drain excess water from both pits into a nearby irrigation canal. But a chemical researcher who has worked closely with both DEQ and EPA, but asked not to be identified in this interview, said that practice could be dangerous. DEQ plans to discharge the water from the two pits into the irrigation canal surrounding the site and hold back on the sludge that's floating on the surface and the bottom sludge. Now DEQ claims there are no harmful contaminants in the water, but you have seen some of the tests. Do you believe that? No, I do not. The tests show that there is significant inorganic and organic contamination in the water in both pits. The type of contaminants that could be harmful to people and to animals? That's correct. And the water in the ditches is used for irrigation of rice fields, crawfish ponds, as well as watering of cattle. They have heavy metals, priority pollutants, organic compounds, volatile organic compounds, as well as acid and base neutral organic compounds. Why should people who live in this area, people of Abbeville and people of Vermilion Parish, why should they be concerned about these type of contaminants? What's the danger to them? The danger is that they are priority pollutants. They've been placed on this list by EPA as uh, agents that cause cancer, and therefore the people should be concerned. Why then would DEQ allow this water to be placed into an irrigation canal? I don't have an answer for that. But you are worried? But I am worried. A lot of other people are worried as well. Historically, the residents of Vermilion Parish have been close-knit. But in recent years, the issue of hazardous wastes often has pitted neighbor against neighbor. 
Do you think many people got into this business a long time ago thinking they'd make money but not realizing what the long-term consequences were? I really believe that. I really believe that. I think some people did it maliciously. I think some people did it just because times were hard, farming wasn't good, and it was a way to make money. And, and they didn't see that there was a potential danger of water contamination. But I think now it's coming back to haunt us. Farmers in Vermilion Parish are especially concerned about the long-term consequences of contamination from hazardous waste sites and disposal pits. How has their land been affected? Will it hurt yields in the future? Will it poison our food just as it has some of our underground drinking supplies? Everywhere the same questions. Today, more and more farmers, many of whom in the past staunchly defended the use of potentially dangerous pesticides and herbicides, are even beginning to question their effects on the land and on people. Is it safe to spray crops? Can we continue to take chances with the environment? Questions with no easy answers. What's going to take for people to get together and try and work out the problems? It's going to take uh, probably more information from uh, our public bodies that, that have that type of information. For instance, the hospitals, the uh, Department of Health and Human Welfare, uh, Probably a few contaminated, a few more contaminated water wells, maybe a few city, cities to have contaminated water supply before people really sit down and look at the entire problem seriously and develop some serious guidelines as to how we can dispose of all our waste in a proper manner. For so many years, of course, Louisiana was the butt of a lot of jokes. People said that this state was the dumping ground for the rest of the nation. Do you think people in Louisiana, people especially in Kaplan in this area are finally saying enough is enough? I think they are. I think people have finally reached their saturation point and I think they are determined that they will find and elect people that will represent them, represent the way they feel about environmental issues. I think that we're tired. And some people say disgusted as well. Yet there is hope in Kaplan and in Abbeville and other Vermilion Parish towns that one day the land can be restored to what it once was. Dreams, perhaps, but something many people here feel they owe to future generations, to those who have yet to come, as well as something they owe to those who have come and gone. <laughs> Trouble in Paradise will be back in a moment with a look at the link between chemicals and cancer and a report on groundwater contamination. We bring you the news behind the headlines, analyze the reasons why. This Friday night on Louisiana The State We're In, a special Valentine's Day report on how a nationally recognized team of Louisiana doctors and researchers are helping hundreds of parents across the state beat the problem of infertility. Celebrating 10 years as Louisiana's brightest vision, this is LPB.
I think we have a, a potentially very serious threat uh, to the groundwater resources in the state. We're finding every week new sources of, of groundwater contamination across the state, uh, whether it's underground storage tanks, old abandoned pits, uh, wells. Uh, all of these different things can provide conduits for waste to move down into aquifers. <laughs> Generally speaking, once groundwater becomes contaminated, it's virtually impossible to clean it up. What we've done is destroyed a large part of our environment that simply will not be healed anytime soon. Groundwater contamination, some call it the silent killer. There are literally thousands of hazardous waste sites and disposal pits around Louisiana. Many of them, if not most of them, are leaking toxic chemicals and materials. Slowly, unnoticed and undetected for the most part, those dangerous hazardous wastes are moving through the Earth's layers, threatening to poison underground aquifers. State officials admit groundwater contamination is a concern, something that could become a problem in the future. But environmentalists insist groundwater contamination is already a problem, one that could haunt Louisiana into the next century and beyond. If the injection wells are properly maintained and policed, which they are not here in Louisiana, uh, and they don't leak, then the waste that's being pumped underground presumably is going into very deep water strata. Now, there's no guarantee that we won't need that very deep water at some point in the future, and if we do, we're out of luck. It's been contaminated. Oh, that's correct. Once you contaminate an underground freshwater aquifer, uh, there's some scientists who say you can never get it back. It's gone forever. And so the, the, the problem of contaminating an uh, above-ground stream, which you can cure, you can come back and do remedial work and have that stream back in shape, is not the same when you contaminate an underground aquifer. It's much more critical. And I'm afraid folks in Louisiana don't yet have an appreciation of how important those freshwater aquifers are. It is one of the, the most serious uh, long-term environmental problems we're confronting. We really don't know how much of a short-term problem it is because we haven't done the kind of testing it takes to determine how contaminated our groundwater already is. We're just beginning to do that testing. And what we're finding out thus far is, is pretty frightening. Louisiana, of course, has a wealth of natural resources, rich oil and gas reserves, an abundance of valuable fur-bearing animals, and some of the world's best fish and seafood. But the state's most treasured natural resource, fresh water, may also be its most abused. It's the same story from one end of the state to the other. You can begin with the obvious, the mighty Mississippi River polluted by industrial waste and agricultural pesticides. Then there are the countless lakes and bayous polluted by sewerage and human waste. And now Louisiana's invaluable, irreplaceable underground aquifers are in danger of being polluted by hazardous wastes. To environmentalists, the thought is chilling. You have, for example, a water program that's supposed to regulate water pollution. Well, in Louisiana, the permits happen to be written far easier for the same industries than they are in New Jersey or California or Texas or other places in the country. Same kinds of refineries, but higher permit discharge levels. So the permits come easy. The monitoring is less frequent. The enforcement after the monitoring is less severe. It wasn't until Pat Norton came in at DEQ that you had anybody fined at all for pollution violations other than the occasional sensational spill. Um, it has been most recently uh, reported, and it's pretty, uh, pretty definite, that the collection of the fines is minimal. So the fact is that if you pollute in Louisiana, nothing happens to you. Meanwhile, if you pollute in Louisiana, everything happens for you in terms of sales tax exemptions, property tax exemptions, ad valorem tax exemptions, etc. We stand like some dirty old Statue of Liberty, just raising our arms and saying, come on down, y'all. Pollute the hell out of us. Just bring me that poison. Uh, and that's Louisiana. That's still the mindset. It's been called the blue marble. Blue because 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water.
But only 3% of all the water on Earth is fresh, and only one-tenth of that is readily available for our use. It's a precious, fragile resource, and life itself depends upon it. It is somewhat ironic, perhaps tragic is a better way of saying it, that Louisiana, the state which hosted the 1984 World's Fair with its much publicized theme, Freshwater, a Source of Life, is now in danger of poisoning much of its own freshwater supplies because of neglect, carelessness, even indifference. For all too many years, there was a sort of what I can't see can't hurt me type of feeling when it came to the disposal of hazardous wastes pump it into the ground, dump it into pits, bury it in landfills. Get rid of it, but do it cheaply and quickly. It happened every day in the past with an almost reckless disregard for what it could do in the future. Chemical industry, Ken, has changed entirely on this area. In the last, oh, five or 10 years, what we have done is to support legislation to clean up the sites around Louisiana. We're very interested and very hopeful that we can get this problem behind us very soon. Um, as you know, the chemical industry makes products, not hazardous waste. And we're just one of many groups, by the way, that uses hazardous waste sites. For instance, hospitals are something that needs to be done for your friendly dentist who, with his x-rays and so forth. So we have spent an awful lot of time in trying to um, make Louisiana a cleaner state from our viewpoint. The danger is there because in Louisiana, so many of our aquifers are interconnected. In other words, we don't tend to have uh, many confining layers of clay. Uh, and sometimes even where clay is, is located, it can be fractured or fissured, and you can still have pathways for waste to move through clay. Also, some of the waste actually moves through clay very quickly. So it's difficult for us to feel very confident at this point that our aquifers are totally protected and there's no threat of these wastes moving through. Up to now, we have found primarily contamination of the upper zone, say 100 to 150 feet down. Have not found anything that deep, say in the 400 or below uh, level. But these wastes are moving through and will eventually reach the aquifers if they're not stopped and corrected. The consequences if we were uh, not successful and contaminants did reach the uh, groundwater would be that we would have to start uh, shutting down use of them, uh, of these water resources. And that would mean, at a minimum, uh, protection of the public health by provision of alternative drinking water sources. It would mean that some of them might no longer be satisfactory for uh, irrigation for agricultural purposes. And that, I think, would have an impact. In other words, we'd be poisoning these supplies, in effect? Yes. One man who claims his water already has been poisoned is cattleman and rice farmer Johnny Boudreaux of Vermillion Parish. He says the well at his home on Agnes Plantation was contaminated by hazardous wastes. Well, my big concern was they were applying for a landfill across the river from my house, right on the Vermillion River itself. As it is now, we can't drink the water at my home now because the water well is contaminated. I had it checked a few years ago and it had 17 times the amount of barium and 2.2 above EPA's drinking water standards for chromium. So we had to purchase a distiller to be able to drink our water there. And my water well at home, uh, being contaminated as it is, makes you wonder because I'm miles away from any pit or injection well. So it must be traveling through the uh, Chico aquifer sands to get to my well from miles away. Essentially, an aquifer is a layer of water-saturated sands or rocks located below the surface soils. Louisiana has five major aquifers, which supply an abundance of groundwater resources, more than half of the state's irrigation needs, and nearly 45% of its drinking water. The most prolific is the Chico Aquifer. It is the primary source of fresh water for a 13 parish area, including the city of Lafayette. More than one billion gallons of water a day are pumped out of the Chico. There's cases within the nation, in the nation, where aquifers have been contaminated. And uh, so that, yes, they can be contaminated by waste that are put on or in the shallow uh, groundwater. There are five major sources of groundwater contamination. One is from pesticides and irrigation. A second source of groundwater contamination is from hazardous waste injection wells. A third source, landfills and dumps. Streams and rivers are also contaminated by discharges. And another source of contamination 
is from lagoons and pits. Well, uh, of course, the, the aquifers are protected by uh, surface clays. Uh, and the clays restrict the movement of, uh, of pesticides and uh, organics. Um, but still, there are some organics that can uh, pass through the clays very slowly. Um, so the potential is there uh, for uh, uh, contaminating the aquifer system, but uh, we have very little information on just uh, how the degree of contamination at this point. Although most of the drinking water drawn from the Chico Aquifer come from sands down 100 feet or more, some people in isolated rural areas get their water from shallow wells that may be the first spots hit with pollution from pesticides, septic tanks, oil field waste pits, and hazardous waste dumps. A recent state report revealed that at least 26 hazardous waste sites are leaking contaminants into underground water systems, and another 50 to 60 sites are suspected of the same thing. But officials admit the report may be only scratching the surface of the problem. There are a staggering number of potential trouble spots. 20,000 oil field waste pits, 40,000 underground storage tanks, and some 350 abandoned or inactive hazardous waste sites. So far, only a handful of them have been tested for pollution. Well, there have been some contamination uh, problems found at uh, lower, at aquifers that are near the surface but are connected to the lower aquifers. We have not yet found any major aquifer, say the Chico aquifer, the Wilcox aquifer, that has been significantly contaminated with, with pollutants. But since there is this connection, then there is the risk that some of these chemicals could eventually move into the aquifers. How do you protect them? Can you protect them? Well, we feel like the best way to protect the groundwater in the state is prevention of contamination in the first place. We need to make sure that the wells that we construct are, are constructed properly, septic tanks, pits, agricultural usage, all these different things have to be conducted in a way so that you don't create the problem in the first place. That aside, we have to go back and look at all the past practices that could now be resulting in groundwater contamination. And that's where the problem is going to lie, because it's so difficult to go back into a situation and try to remove the contaminated groundwater. The city of Lafayette has two water treatment plants that pump an average of 15 million gallons of water a day from the Chico Aquifer. Most of the city's 13 wells are located from 300 to 600 feet deep. Water to renew the Chico comes from three main sources. Rainwater, leakage from the coastal marshlands, and the adjacent Atchafalaya Aquifer. These sources have provided the Chico with a consistently high quality and apparently inexhaustible supply of water, a valuable, irreplaceable natural resource that could be endangered in the years ahead by pollution. Well, the Chico Aquifer is our, our only source of water. Uh, it provides the water for 120,000 people that use our, you know, use our system. Do you have an alternative? Not at this time. Is water something we've taken for granted in the state for too long? I believe water has been taken for granted too long in every state. Uh, you know, we just can't assume that you, you, you put something in the ground and it disappears. Uh, I think through, you know, regulation and enforcement of regulations, you can protect the groundwater. It would be difficult for Lafayette in particular because it uses the Chico Aquifer and that's a sole source aquifer. That means that there are no other aquifers in the area that could be tapped. Uh, that would mean that Lafayette would have to find some very expensive uh, filtering and treatment method to, to render the, the Chico Aquifer water safe or wouldn't have to import water from, from another area of the state. There are two aquifers in, in Louisiana that are sole source aquifers and we are very concerned that those aquifers in particular need to be protected. One suspected source of groundwater contamination is oil field waste pits. They are regulated by the Department of Conservation and not by the Department of Environmental Quality. That has touched off a sort of environmental tug of war. Critics say the Department of Conservation is more of a friend to the oil industry than a regulator. Sort of like having the fox guard the chicken house. But this year, at the urging of the Conservation Department, the Louisiana legislature passed a tough new set of environmental regulations for oil field waste pits. Environmentalists still aren't happy with the regulations, but Conservation Commissioner Herbert Thompson said there must be a balance between the oil and gas industry and the environment. Uh, some of it naturally is hazardous. Uh, however, the large percentage, the largest percentage of it is not hazardous. And this is one of the things that I, I think that, that where the, the common sense comes in and the logical management of waste comes in is that, uh, just think, one of the, the biggest wastes that we have to deal with in the oil field today is salt water. Are we going to make salt water hazardous? 
I mean, it, it becomes ridiculous whenever you get to that point. Balance is a code word. There's no doubt about it. Anytime somebody wants you to back off an environmental standard, he'll come to you and ask you to be reasonable and have a little balance in the decision. So uh, what he's asking you to do is trade a few lives for a little money. And uh, if uh, you're willing to trade lives for money, then you're balanced. And if you're willing to trade a lot of lives and a lot of health and a lot of human suffering and misery, for somebody's money, then you're very balanced and you're quite well qualified to be a good administrator. The problem in combating groundwater contamination is one of money more than technology. State officials say it costs an estimated $25,000 to investigate an average site and up to $1 million for a major site. The state doesn't have the money and guilty industries are often reluctant to part with the money. As a result, only a handful of potentially dangerous sites around the state, out of thousands, have been cleaned up so far. Environmentalists say the delay is forcing Louisiana into a sort of do-or-die game of Russian roulette. You seem to be saying that unless something's done, we will reach a point of no return. That's quite possible. Definitely in the area of uh, some of these abandoned wells and the abandoned hazardous waste sites where we have very toxic chemicals that are moving through the groundwater. This is the Mary Bird Perkins Radiation Center in Baton Rouge. Every day, more than 100 people are treated for cancer at this one facility alone. Imagine it, more than 100 people a day. Some of them are children, others are young professionals, housewives, blue-collar workers, retired workers. Some rich, some poor, but all of them, every single one of them, shares the same hope, to live. They suffer from every kind of cancer imaginable. Skin cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, stomach cancer. Their cases are different, but their questions are always the same. Why me? Why now? Why isn't there a cure? Tough questions, but none more difficult than the one just about everyone is afraid of asking, will I die? Day in and day out, patients, doctors, and researchers grope for answers. There are several problems. One, cancer in itself is a relatively rare disease. Not many people develop cancer. Over the years, uh, maybe a fourth or a third of the people will develop cancer. But you have a living population, say, of 100,000 people, adults, only a few hundred will develop cancer in, the, in a few years. So that being a chronic disease, you cannot, uh, and, a, and a rare disease, it's not like an epidemic or smallpox or something that will affect a large proportion of the population in a very short period of time, then you know there's an epidemic. But for an epidemic due to chemicals, you will need to uh, see millions of people over 20 years or so. This we do know for certain. Louisiana consistently ranks among the top 10 states in the country in cancer deaths, with these areas of Louisiana being affected the most. But that's only part of the story. The mortality rate for white males in this state suffering from lung cancer is the highest in the nation. Why? What's the answer? Well, many researchers believe there is an irrefutable link between smoking and the petrochemical industry. A study by Dr. Maurice Gottlieb of the Tulane University School of Medicine concluded that people who live within a mile and a half of one or more industries run twice to three times the risk of getting lung cancer than those people living outside the area. Subsequent studies by Dr. Gottlieb found a correlation between how close a person lives to industries and various other types of cancer as well. Well, there have been documented cases in Louisiana where people in chemical plants have, as part of their job, was to go in and scrape out old vats or clean out waste pits uh, with no protective gear on, no even rubber gloves or boots, no face mask, and they would get chemical burns or uh, uh, some of their glands would swell up and they become very sick and they were oftentimes said they were accused of being lazy and, and shiftless and not wanting to uh, work in the plants. Uh, very likely their problem was exposure to chemicals that were destroying their health. Uh, at one time there was not the emphasis on the environment that it should have been but that was many years ago. That's history. And the chemical industry wasn't alone in this. I'm not trying to be defensive of our industry. We just weren't as careful as, as we should have been, particularly in the disposal of hazardous materials. But that's over with today. Uh, there are federal laws, there are state laws, and there's very much an industry 
opinion to do something about it, and we have been trying to do it and are doing a very good job, we think, in disposal practices today. Many environmentalists and researchers aren't so sure. They're convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that toxic chemicals and hazardous wastes are important links in the chain of events that lead to cancer, those dreaded malignant growths, those tumors that spread and ulcerate, destroying parts of the body, in many cases resulting in death, often a slow, painful death. A recent governor's task force on cancer found that every day 21 Louisiana residents die of the disease and 41 new cases are diagnosed. That translates into more than 7,600 deaths a year and nearly 15,000 new cases. The report concluded that nearly one death per hour in Louisiana is reason to be gravely concerned. I think a lot of the exposure that's occurred has been misdiagnosed or just simply overlooked or not understood by the, the doctors and the people in the industry and the, the workers. And until we begin to understand what chemicals we're exposed to and what kind of health effects they can have, uh, we're going to continue to have these mysterious uh, uh, health problems and cancer rates around the state. One of those mysterious health problems was documented in a long, bitter court fight. 57-year-old Paul Waltrip was a machinist in a Baton Rouge plant that produced plastics and synthetic rubber. He worked there for more than two decades. Then he discovered he had cancer of the colon. Following two major operations, he sued his employer, Uniroyal, and several companies that supplied chemicals to the plant for more than $11 million, blaming his cancer on exposure to various chemicals. He later settled for about $800,000. Today, Waltrip continues to see doctors almost daily, suffering from a wide range of medical and emotional problems. Waltrip refused to talk about his case because of memory loss, but his wife, in a telephone interview, said the ordeal has been traumatic. He's still very ill. He can, uh, as I said, carry on a conversation with you, but he's not comfortable with anything. Uh, like talking to you, uh, he referred you to his wife because he, he, he was afraid you would ask him a date or like you just asked me when did we settle the court case, you know, and he wouldn't have remembered. And the doctor said that there's no getting better on this, that there were brain cells destroyed that will never return because his fever was so high during this t period that he was in a coma. It's been a long, tough battle then. It's huh? been a rough, rough battle, and he's not well yet, not by a long shot. And uh, it's to the doctor, you know, real often, and medication every day. The Waltrip's attorney, Charles Moore, believes the case proved beyond all doubt that prolonged exposure to toxic chemicals can cause cancer. Well, Mr. Waldrop, during the course and scope of his employment, was exposed to acrylonitrile. He was a millwright. He worked with the pumps. There were sloppy procedures in the plant. He was exposed to the acrylonitrile during the, his normal duties. Uh, and there were instances where it uh, ran on the ground or ran in open sewer. So there's no question but that during his employment, he was exposed to acrylonitrile. Our people live here, too. They're not immune to any diseases or anything. And I will assure you, the chemical industry, you've got to look who's employed there. Who do we have? We have scientists. We have chemical engineers. We have chemists. We have MDs. We are in the pharmaceutical business. If there's anyone that ought to know about health in this country, it's the chemical industry. Diagnosing cancer is one thing, but determining the cause of it, well, that's something different. This is a section of a live colon tumor which is being tested just minutes after it was removed during surgery. A tumor similar to the one found inside Paul Waltrip. Thousands of Louisiana men and women Waltrip's age have spent a large part of their lives working in the state's petrochemical industry or living near plants and chemical waste dumps. Some environmentalists and cancer specialists believe that carcinogens or cancer-causing substances produced along with plastics chemicals and gasoline are triggering a cancer epidemic that is just beginning to surface. The most eye-opening evidence was presented in a study by the Council on Economic Priorities, a New York-based environmental research agency. The study draws a statistically significant correlation between increasing concentrations of petrochemical toxic waste and the growing rates of cancer. 
Taconville, Louisiana. The report said that area generates more than 100,000 pounds of waste a year, 127 times the national average. Um, there's no, nothing that I know of to support those kind of claims. Louisiana, and I want to go on record on this, has very high lung cancer rates. It's very high lung cancer rates in South Louisiana for white males. Now, it follows suit that if it was the general environment, we would all have lung cancer. This is just simply not true. Well, the problem is this, that uh, the scientific community is in a dilemma. We do know that there are chemicals that are carcinogenic in the wells and in the river and in the sources of water of the community. That we know. And now, we know that there is a very high rate of cancer in Louisiana, okay? But to be scientific, we have to make the connection. That could take a long, costly study. Is it worth it? Well, consider these facts. The petrochemical industry in Louisiana employs more than 185,000 people. Another quarter of a million people are indirectly employed. The petrochemical industry also pumps more than $2 billion a year into the state treasury in taxes, royalties, and bonuses. $2 billion a year. Yet the state, in its 1985-86 budget, appropriated only $861,000 for cancer research and cancer-related programs, and nothing, zero, not a penny, toward the cleanup of abandoned hazardous waste sites. What we have, basically, is a very large uh, uh, study that's going on. It's the human population in this state that's been exposed to a great variety of chemicals, and not just Louisiana, but a number of other states. But, but you're saying these people are being used as guinea pigs, And we basically are guinea pigs. And maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, we'll find out what we're being affected by. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's a serious problem. It's not being dealt with effectively. And up until very recently, it was ignored completely. Lack of research by itself does not produce cancer, but it doesn't find the reasons for having the cancer. So there's a possibility that people are, are uh, exposed to this carcinogenic and they may be having health effects that we don't know about. With respect to chemical contamination, the contamination which uh, a person is exposed to today may not demonstrate its effects for 20 years or 30 years. So basically, to suggest that we delay cleanup while we wait for studies to come in is to suggest that we continue to expose people to these risks for 20 or 30 years um, on the chance that we'll get away lucky and, uh, and not have any adverse effect. I think if in 20 or 30 years the body count starts to come in, then um, our children and uh, their children won't look back and thank us for not having taken action now. Whose river was this? You say it ran freely. Blue was its color. I've seen blue in some pictures. And I'd love to have been there I tell me again I need to know The forests had trees The meadows were green The oceans were blue And birds really flew Can you swear that was true? There are very few states in the nation that have suffered as much and will continue for a long time to suffer as a result of some of the sloppy practices that uh, hazardous waste generators and disposers have used uh, nationwide. Other states have similar problems, but few of them have it uh, in as many places and in, 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 in as concentrated a fashion as Louisiana does. It's going to cost us probably billions to get out from under this problem. No doubt about it, Louisiana has paid a staggering price for the neglect of its land, its air, and its water. We've paid the price, but have we learned the lesson? Whose garden was this? It must have been lovely. Did it have flowers? I've seen pictures of flowers, and I'd love to have smelled one. When it comes to the disposal of hazardous wastes, there is a right way and a wrong way, a safe way and a dangerous way, an expensive way and a cheap way. 
For too many years in Louisiana, many reputable industries, in some ways no different than the outlaw midnight dumpers, took the wrong, dangerous, cheap way out. The technologies for dealing with hazardous waste in a fashion much better than we've traditionally done it uh, is improving. It, there has been technology available that could have done a better job for a long time, but, but there's been no incentive to use it because the regulatory program, programs have been ineffective. And as a rule, the better technology is more expensive, so the, the operators have chosen to, uh, to cut their costs by, by leaving us a, a, a toxic burden that we're going to have to cope with for, for years, if not generations. In the past, uh, most people took the very easy way out. That was to put hazardous waste directly into the river, into landfills, or into uh, other very cheap, accessible disposal sites. This has changed because of tightening regulation and because of management philosophy. What we've seen is a change in philosophy here in that we are going to treat our waste and treat it well on site and do away with the liability of that waste. If we burn it and incinerate it properly, we do away with that liability. In the past, much of this waste was put into landfills, and we still have that liability, as is evidenced by the cleaning up of many of the old hazardous waste sites in, in the state. Many critics say Louisiana would not have the problems it does today if companies 10, 15, even 20 years ago had to follow the rules and regulations that govern companies today. There are at present four widely accepted methods of disposing of hazardous wastes. Incineration, solid waste landfills, injection wells, and biological closure, which is the use of microorganisms or bacteria to break down dangerous compounds. Dow Chemical is recognized as one of the leaders in incineration technology. In 1981, Dow constructed a $13 million general purpose rotary kiln incinerator system at its Plaquemine plant. Unlike other incinerators, a rotary kiln can destroy solids, liquids, sludges, gases, even whole containers of toxic materials. Incineration is actually a simple chemical oxidation reaction. Organic material made up largely of carbon and hydrogen is reacted with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water vapor. 99.99% of the hazardous wastes are destroyed in this process. Okay, steam pressure is 25, and we're going to go to 30 on the valve. Currently, what you're seeing right now is the board operator uh, in communications with one of the outside operators is trying to get the proper adjustment on a flow to the incinerator to ensure that they're not overfeeding the incinerator, and that's what they're currently trying to adjust it. Using the computer, they can, you know, they can monitor what that flow is and make the necessary adjustments from here in the control room while the man out in the field watches the, the burning operation inside the kiln. The purpose of the computer monitoring is to ensure that we're getting adequate destruction in our incinerator, and we do that by monitoring the temperatures and the CO in the stack. If either the temperatures in the kiln or the CO on the stack goes too high, then the, it's, there's an automatic shutdown on the feeds to incinerator. This is how we ensure that we're getting proper destruction of the waste. The system will automatically shut down if there's a process upset. For the most part, the process is safe, clean, and efficient, but it's also expensive. Researchers say one way to cut costs is to biologically treat hazardous wastes. These are microorganisms seen under a microscope, living one-celled bacteria that multiply rapidly. Now, when most people think of bacteria, they think of diseases, tuberculosis, pneumonia, even strep throat. But today, microorganisms are being used, in essence, to eat organic waste material as food, and in doing so, convert it to carbon dioxide and water. Uh, microorganisms are decomposers. Uh, man, for centuries, have been taking advantage 
of the ability of microorganisms to degrade, to decompose organic materials uh, for various purposes. Uh, you take the uh, domestic uh, uh, municipal waste, typical sewage plant. We take advantage of the ability of uh, microorganisms to process and degrade that organic material. Uh, in the situation we're discussing here, we are just focusing a old technology, domestic waste treatment, and we are now approaching it uh, in terms of hazardous waste, taking microorganisms and attempting to accomplish the same things. This is the old Inger hazardous waste site near Geismar. It's an environmental nightmare, a real mess. It's also on the EPA Superfund hit list. Researchers are hoping to use this as a pilot project for the rest of the country. State officials say conventional cleanup of this site, where contaminated soil is dug up, containerized, and then hauled away to approved landfills, could cost between four and five million dollars. That figure could be cut in half by using microorganisms. If you move a toxic waste from one site to another, you're causing some problems because the actual digging it up usually puts more into a, a water body, if there's a local water body, into the streams. Uh, if you haul it in trucks, you've got a chance for accidents on the road. If you put it into another disposal site where they're not doing things just absolutely right, that site itself may turn out to be a hazardous waste problem in the future. The best thing is to destroy it on site if you can. It's the safest, it's the cleanest, it's the best way to do it. Whether it's the use of microorganisms, or incineration, or solid waste landfills. The technology is there to begin cleaning up Louisiana, but it will take time and money, and after years and years of neglect, we may be in danger of running out of both. During our investigation of hazardous waste and groundwater contamination, we learned a lot of things. But first and foremost, we came to realize that nothing can be done to solve the problem until we realize there is a problem. No doubt about it, we've made a lot of progress. Tougher environmental rules and regulations, better public awareness programs, and a gradual but noticeable change in the attitudes of a lot of people in Louisiana. A recent statewide poll showed that more than 50% of the voters in this state believe the environment will be a politically volatile issue in the next governor's race. Still, as a matter of public policy, protecting the environment continues to rank near the bottom of Louisiana's priority list. This is a state that has spent $50 billion on government since the petroprocessors mess was first uncovered. By contrast, this is a state that has spent precious little money protecting its environment. There is, of course, still time to preserve the environment for future generations. But the really frightening thing is no one, not a single person, can say for certain just how much time. Thank you for watching, and good evening. Trouble in Paradise has been a special 90-minute documentary report brought to you exclusively by Louisiana Public Broadcasting.